How much force does it take to cause a concussion injury? Hello and welcome to our channel. I'm Dr. Cameron Marshall, aka Concussion Doc, and I am here to help you understand concussion injuries a little bit better. In this video, we are talking all about concussion forces. How hard do you have to be hit in the head to get a concussion? And we're also going to show you a bunch of studies that help us to kind of figure this all out. This video is the second video in our new series designed specifically to help concussion patients to optimize your recovery and to heal your brain for good. So whether you've just had a concussion and are looking for how to best recover, or whether you've been suffering from a concussion for the past 10 years and you're still having symptoms and want to figure out why, this video series is going to help you understand just that. Once you understand the why, then we can help you to figure out how to fix it. So if you are new to the channel, please be sure to subscribe, give this video a good thumbs up if you enjoy the content, and leave any comments or questions that you have below. If there's other things that you want covered that we haven't really touched on, uh, or if you need additional information, feel free to comment that in the, in the chat below, and I will do my best to uh, get back to you. If you know someone that you think would benefit from this content, please be sure to share it with them. And if you are still struggling with concussion symptoms and you want a little bit of extra help, be sure to check out the links below in the description as we put all sorts of various helpful tips and tools down there. Uh, for example, I frequently do a live webinar series. We have all sorts of different uh, posts and things that can help you out if you are needing a little bit of extra care for your concussion and want to figure out what to do. So let's dive in. How much force does it take to cause a concussion injury. First of all, let's do a quick recap of our last video. And if you didn't catch that last video, you can click up in the upper part of the screen and there's a link that will take you right to that first video which talks about what a concussion is and all the pathophysiological things, all the science behind what happens inside the brain. That's important as a uh, initial step before we dive into this content. So first off, if you have seen that video, here's a quick recap. If you haven't, check out the previous video. So concussion is from acceleration and deceleration. If we remember from our first video, we can see this kind of fluid wave come through the brain and the concussion is actually due to stretching and shearing of the brain cells, right? We have the two t different tissue densities and they accelerate and decelerate at different rates. And so we're thinking of axons as these long tubes, right? Our brain cells are actually these long kind of tubes. And if, like I said, if you haven't seen the first video, you're gonna wanna go back and check that out. And this is kind of what they look like. They're not actually solid. There's little holes all around them, little pores. It's called a porous membrane. And when there's acceleration or deceleration and the brain is moving and kind of going through that fluid wave process, you get stretching. And with that stretching, you get opening of these pores. And with the opening of the pores, you get a release of potassium and an influx of sodium and calcium coming into the cell, which causes an action potential. So a concussion, once it hits enough acceleration to, to stretch enough, you're going to get ion exchange. And with ion exchange, if it happens to a significant enough degree, you're going to get discharge and depolarization and firing of neurons. So you get this electrical storm. But how much force do we actually require to have this happen? Well, we have a bunch of research. Most of it, unfortunately, is done on male athletes. And so there's going to be some caveats and some nuance here. But I'll show you the data around male athletes. And also some stuff we have on, on some female soccer players uh, and as well as children. So let's dive in. Concussion is typically measured with accelerometers because concussion is an acceleration deceleration injury. So what they've done in the past and most of the studies use a, a system called the HIT system. So this stands for head impact telemetry or, or telemetry, which is six accelerometers placed inside of a football helmet of, of you know, the triaxial. So they measure all different degrees of motion and they'll put that in players' helmets and they'll measure them for seasons over practices and games and look at A, how many hits they're taking and how much force is in those hits and 
if there is a concussion, how much force it took to cause that concussive injury. And what we found is that the range in high school and college football players is between 70 and 120 Gs, Gs being the force of gravity. 9.8 9.8 meters per second squared. So 70 to 120 Gs of linear acceleration is concussion kind of range, and 5,500 to 9,500 rads per second squared of rotational acceleration. Now, there's some speculation that the rotational acceleration is more important, and there's others that say, well, it just depends on which type of acceleration surpasses the threshold required for concussion injury. Now, we can see that there's a range and it's quite wide. Some people will get concussed towards the bottom end of this range. Some people will get concussed towards the top end of this range. And so everyone's a little bit different. The highest predictive occurrence in this particular study here by Clark was found to be 96 Gs and 5,500 rads per second squared was the mean kind of peak threshold there. And you can see here, it doesn't matter where in the head that you're hit so long as the acceleration forces get to a high enough degree to cause concussion injury. There was a systematic review and meta-analysis, which is a collection of a whole bunch of studies that was done in 2016. There was 1.5 million hits that were taken into consideration. And they, again, found similar kind of ratio. The peak mean linear acceleration was 98.7 Gs. The range was between 82 and 115. And rotational acceleration was 5,700 rads per second, so kind of in that range. And the range was 4,500 to 7,000-ish in this systematic review and meta-analysis. So you can see the ranges kind of line up. This was all in football players. Estimates from motor vehicle accidents show that subdural hematomas or bleeding inside the brain happens around 316 Gs. So you can see here that the acceleration, deceleration type of force is what kind of contributes to all, all types of, of contact related brain injuries. It just depends on the magnitude of force. Below concussion threshold, you may get some issues that don't actually cause symptoms. Those are called subconcussive impacts. And within the concussion range, you get, you know, potentially concussion related symptoms. As you get beyond the concussion range, you're ending up with more severe forms of brain injury, potentially brain bleeds and things like that. Now, if we look at football, we see that 77% of all the impacts that happen in high school football are actually below 30 Gs. So there's this misconception that football and is causing concussions, but you don't get a concussion on every single hit. It's actually less than 1% of all the hits in football that result in a concussion. We're only dealing with this kind of range. And you can see how f- infrequent this is. And this is why you don't see a concussion on every single play when you're watching a football game. You just see them here and there. And that's because it's actually more of a rare, not I wouldn't say rare, but a less frequent occurrence than these hits, which are the typical you know, every play hits that you will see. Now in hockey, we see kind of similar uh, uh, measures here. We don't have the actual concussion threshold, but we can assume it's going to be the same, uh, especially when you're dealing with male athletes of the same age. But you see here the mean head acceleration in most hockey contact is 18.4 Gs, well below the threshold required for concussion. Again, this is why you don't see a concussion on every single play in hockey. And this is looking at younger athletes. So again, high school age, 13 to 18 years old, 18.4 18.4 Gs is the is the average and 1400 rads per second squared which is well below the 5500 kind of range that we need for concussion injury. Soccer headers, right? Under girl under 14 age girls, the average linear G force is only 20 Gs, well below the threshold for concussion. 1900 rads per second squared, well below the threshold for rotational acceleration. College, same kind of forces, about 20 Gs. And this is because everything is proportional. As you get bigger, your necks will get stronger. You're able to tolerate more force, but the ball is coming at you with greater velocity. And so everything kind of balances out uh, as as players get older. And similar with football, you see similar G-forces in youth football as you do in college and high school football. And this is because of, you know, you have young kids with these big heads that are able to move around, but they're getting hit by smaller athletes. And so everything is somewhat proportional. And it's really interesting to kind of see that. Less than 10% of concussions in soccer come from the ball hitting the head. 
most concussions in soccer actually come from player to player contact. And there's all these rules that are being put into place to kind of ban heading in soccer or even wearing these headbands to avoid concussion injuries in soccer. But yet less than 10% of all concussions in soccer actually come from heading the ball or ball contact with the head. And actually studies done on these devices actually show that there's no effect. Soccer headgear did not reduce the incidence or severity of concussion in high school soccer players because remember concussion is the brain moving inside the skull so it doesn't matter what you put on the outside of the skull it's not going to really make much of a difference for you and this was a large study 2700 people in this particular uh, study how about boxing okay all out punch to the face this was olympic boxers punching a mannequin to see how much g-force could be delivered and what they found was that the mean peak linear acceleration was only 58 g's so on a jab, punching linearly, you're only able to achieve 58 Gs. This is likely why you don't see a lot of knockouts in boxing happening on a jab. But with rotation, you do see the forces surpass the concussion threshold. So this is usually why uh, athletes are more likely to be knocked out with a hook rather than a jab. Now this has all been in adults and adolescents and also mostly in males. We had some it, some knowledge about girls soccer headers but we didn't know what the concussion threshold was for girls soccer. We just know what the typical g-force is for a header. So we don't really have a lot of data on females that are young female athletes or even middle-aged females. We don't have a lot of information on um, adults and older adults and we don't have a lot of information on kids. There's been a couple studies done on younger kids kids and the first one that was done in 2019 they had 124 players aged 9 to 14 years old and there was 15 concussions over a period of about four seasons so not a lot that was taken into account um, the linear acceleration was actually 62 g's versus adults in high school age was 98 so you can see there's a difference here. The mean uh, linear threshold is actually only 62 Gs and the range was between 33 and 92. So the thought is that kids can actually get concussed with less force. This has been attributed to a variety of things. One, uh, higher you know, head to neck size, so they have a bigger head on a smaller um, neck and less able to control it, especially when you put a big heavy football helmet on it, they're unable to control that. So you don't have as much stability, so a smaller hit can create more acceleration uh, for the brain. Secondly, kids don't have myelin. Remember myelin from our first video was the protective layer. It insulates the cells of the brain with a fatty layer. Kids don't have myelin. You're not fully developed in your myelin until the age like 22 to 25. And so because of that, younger kids are able to potentially get concussed easier because they have less protection in the brain. These are all kind of theoretical, but could be reasons why. Another modeling study in 2019 found that younger children sustained concussive injuries at lower modeled brain strains than adolescents and adults. So I think really the big thing here is with kids. So what do we still not know? As I mentioned, what forces are required in older adults, seniors? We don't know. Most of the study is done in athletes because athletes, it's easy. They wear a helmet or they have a mouth guard or something. You can put an accelerometer and measure them and you know there's going to be concussions. But I can't put accelerometers on every single adult in the population waiting for one of them to slip and fall. So it's just a more difficult population to study. You would have to have such a massive sample size and they would be required to wear these devices at all times because the chance of you getting a concussion if you're an adult that's just going about your day to day working in some office building is a lot different than somebody who's playing football you know, every day and hitting and subjecting themselves to impacts. That's easy to study because we know it's going to happen at some point. So it's an easier study. This is why no studies have been done in adults on this. So we don't know, do seniors get concussed easier? Not really sure. Do adults, uh, do middle-aged women, do middle-aged men? We don't really know. But what we know is that in young, healthy athletes, the threshold seems to be around 70 to 120 Gs, somewhere in there. And that's well below the threshold of most impacts that are happening. In kids, we see it more around the 60G mark in the younger children, so we know they're getting uh, concussed with less force. But what about females? We don't even know how that factors into this because most of the studies have been done in uh, males. And so it seems as though what we do know is that there is some sort of threshold 
and we it's different for everybody so it's very kind of um, you know individualized and we don't have all the information on every single demographic and what that is but um, you know, let, you can comment below and let me know kind of what your concussion was like. How did you get your concussion? And then from there, you can start to have an idea as to how much force may be required in, in some of these populations. So comment below, tell me your story. It's always interesting. There's always some kind of humorous ones that come out, uh, you know, various ways that people bump their heads and, and get uh, concussion injuries. And so uh, also, if you have any questions, be sure to, uh, to comment below. Um, and remember, in our next video, we're we're going to be talking about how do you know if you've actually sustained a concussion and like I said this is part of a video series so if you want to make sure you hit that next video hit the subscribe button hit the bell notification so you'll be reminded as soon as we do release that next video and you can kind of keep up with this video series so that you can understand better what a concussion is what it does inside the brain and how it affects people and even how the persistent symptoms linger and that's going to be covered in some of our later videos so make sure you stay tuned for that if you are struggling like I said there are links below in the description as well to help you out with any lingering ongoing issues that you may be having our goal is here to educate and education is power knowledge is power if you found this video helpful be sure to give it a thumbs up like because YouTube likes that stuff comment below if you have any additional questions if you want some other things covered be sure to let me know stay tuned for the next video feel free to share this as well and uh, I will see you on the next one